We consume textiles all the time. Thanks to textiles, our houses, our bodies, our cars function and look the way we want them to. We tend not to know where these materials come from. These days, our relationship to them is perhaps more virtual than material, less thoroughly embodied than it once was. We don't know where they originate. We consume them, but perhaps we do not understand them. The East Midlands of the United Kingdom has a 450-year history of textile innovation and production. Until the end of the 20th century, it supported a significant industry based on this inventiveness and enterprise. This film draws on work done at Nottingham Trent University to understand part of this industry that continues in a single factory in Ilkeston, Derbyshire, making patterned lace by machine. This lace will be used in high fashion garments. The film shows the complexity of the process, the assemblage of human and mechanical actions that are involved in producing lace. It is about the relationships involved between the workers, between the workers and the machines, between the parts of the process. What the workers know and the knowledge that is in the machines exists in these relationships, this assemblage. Its elements, the characters in the film, include threads of Egyptian cotton and of nylon, workers and machine components that order them and twist them into patterned lace. All of these elements, human, material and mechanical, go to make up the lace machine. For an outsider, the experience of entering the factory is characterised by sound, the sound of mechanical motion. It is a sound that stirs the emotions, part of a technological sublime that is not of our time. Looking in detail at what the work involves, much of the worker's efforts goes into organising the supply of threads while the machine is still. The cotton threads, which show on the surface of the lace, enter the machine from below, stored on long poles called beams. Refilling the beams requires the worker to wind the threads on with just the right tension. Once the beams are ready, they are tied into the threads already in the machine. The normal running of a machine consumes beam threads as they are twisted to make the lace. Tying in a new beam requires both delicate dexterity and thorough understanding of the way the machine is set up. The men who tend the machines are called twist hands because the lace is constructed by twisting the threads to make a stable net, not by weaving. The fine nylon threads that pass between the cotton beam threads are wound in brass bobbins. These sit in steel carriages narrow enough to pass between the beam threads, several thousand in each machine. As the lace is made, the thread in the bobbins is used up and they pass through several sets of hands to remove the remaining thread and wind on a hundred yards of new thread. There are enough bobbins and carriages for each machine so that one set can be on the machine while another is being refilled. The bobbins are very delicate and the winder tests them to make sure the thread will run out. Then each bobbin must be returned to a carriage and the nylon threaded through the hole in the carriage. Before putting them back in the machine, the twist hand checks the carriages by shining them. He holds a pack of them up to the light to look along the edge of each to make sure they are not so thick they will break the beam threads instead of passing between them. Then he sorts them, depending on how easy it is to pull out the thread. He grips a bunch of threads and jogs the bobbins to see which fall and which don't. Repositioning the carriages means lining each one up with the comb bar that guides it in its journey between the beam threads 
from one side of the machine to the other. It is easier to see the path the bobbins take in a drawing of a section of the machine. Here you can see a single bobbin, halfway between front and back, in the middle of its travel. How does the machine get these thousands of carriages from one side to the other? And how does the twisting of the threads happen? And how does the lace finally appear at the top of the machine? Again, this is easier to see in an animation. This animation is looking along the length of the machine at that single bobbin again. The beam threads extend all the way from top to bottom. These components, called catch bars, throw and retrieve the bobbins from each side. Above the bobbins, along the length of the machine, points poke between the beam threads and move upwards alternately from front and back to compress the twists and form the lace structure. The twists and the pattern are formed by movements of the beam threads from left to right. The bobbins swing between them, then they move, then the bobbins swing back. The movement is controlled by a jacquard. The pattern is encoded into holes in a set of punched cards. The information encoded in the cards is transferred into the beam threads by these rods. They're called droppers because when movement is not required, they drop through the holes in the cards. The jacquard controls the movement of long, thin steel strips that run the length of the machine. The beam threads pass through holes in these strips. This animation shows a section of the bobbin threads moving back to front between the beam threads, which move left to right to produce the twist. Here you can see the points pulling up the twists and consolidating the structure. This drawing shows the structure of a plain net. Variations on this, controlled by the jacquard, produce the pattern. Once it is formed by the points, the lace web is pulled up over a spiked roller known as a porcupine and onto the work roller. Now this section of the complete machine makes more sense. Here are the bobbins moving front to back, powered by the catch bars, the beam threads moving left to right, the point bars moving into the fabric up and out again once they have consolidated the twists, with the porcupine and the work roller above them. All this complicated reciprocating motion needs to be generated from a motor, a rotary motion. The machine design achieves this through a combination of cranks and cams. On the left-hand end is a pair of elliptical gears which work together to deliver the right force to a bell crank. The bell crank pushes and pulls two rocker shafts that activate the catch bars in combination with a set of cams that activate the point bars. The point bars have to describe a D-shaped motion so that the points enter the web, move upwards and leave it again. So much for clockwork. The motion of the machine relies on the delicate knowing touch of the twist hands and winders who work with utmost dexterity and sensitivity to keep the machine running. The encounter between knowledge in the hand reasoned knowledge and knowledge encoded in the machine is especially evident when a machine is changed from making one pattern to making another. This image shows the point at which the machine was changed. The jacquard cards must be changed and the beam threads altered to suit. The translation from pattern to code to pattern is represented in the figure sheets that are used to set up the machine. To change the pattern the machine is reset to its dead stop. This is the beginning position of the threads. 
The different forms of knowledge involved are also evident when the twist hands are confronted with a problem, evident usually in a fault in the web. Here, malfunctioning bobbins have created a fault. Once a web is finished, it is pulled off the machine to go to the next part of the process, to be mended. The menders and the twist hands have a particular relationship. One makes work for the other. If the twist hand fails to spot a problem, the mender may have to fix the result. Once it is mended, the lace leaves the factory for dyeing and finishing, returns to be packed, and then goes to the customer. Materials, people, machines, skillful actions. The knowledge of making machine lace is embodied variously in all of these and circulates round a single factory in a small town in Derbyshire.